Okay. So, hi everyone. I am Jillian and I work at UMB Action and we are really, really excited to present the second in a series called UMB Nation! Exclamation Park where we join all uh, UMBs from across the country who are doing organizing in different, all different shapes and sizes of communities and compare notes and share what we're working on, especially when the times uh, they are changing really rapidly and we all need to learn from each other now more than ever. Um, so if you, um, I'm gonna kick it over very quickly to our panelists um, and our moderator, Isaac, from Orange County. Um, but before I do that, um, just a quick plug. So one immediate thing, if you've enjoyed this virtual format um, as a way to connect to UMBs, um, and if you've at all done some project advocacy via the virtual format, so if your planning commission has virtual public comment and you've called in, um, you have likely noticed just how much more representative the people who call in are once we're able to allow virtual capabilities and we want to keep that going. Um, you know, finally, uh, workers and parents can call in to public comment. They don't have to live in the community nearby and come on, you know, Tuesday at 2 p.m. So we actually are running a campaign um, for those who were on the call earlier, you may have heard this mentioned, um, called Keep Public Meetings Public. And we're working to convince jurisdictions across California, but actually across the whole country, um, to continue to allow virtual call-in for public comment way beyond shelter in place, because um, it really is transformative and it's it's something that we need to do for democracy and for equity. So um, sign the petition, and then hopefully we will bring legislation to your community, and we'll be able to keep public meetings public. So that's one quick plug. Um, the second is that all of our organizations are fueled by our activists, and that means your ideas, your energy, um, certainly your time, um, and it also means your donations. So um, we have UMB Action. Um, we have a membership model, so umbaction.org slash join, and that covers our work actually across California. So People for Housing Orange County is part of our umbrella, um, as well as UMB Santa Cruz is part of our umbrella. Um, and so if you want to support that work, uh, please join as a member. Um, and I will give the panelists, I know we have panelists from Massachusetts and from Princeton too. And if you guys have memberships, um, please plug them and we will make sure to send out uh, that information so you guys can support them too, because none of this work happens um, without some resources. So um, I will kick it over to our moderator. Um, so Isaac is a volunteer lead for People for Housing Orange County, which has been doing the hard work in Orange County for years um, and is now um, part of the UB Action umbrella. And one of the most exciting things is that in addition to continue to advocate for housing projects and systems change when it comes to housing, um, they're actually doing electoral endorsements now. So starting to really change the leadership in Orange County, which is really exciting. Um, and Isaac is helping to lead that work in Orange County. So I'll kick it over to you, uh, introduce yourself, and then let's uh, introduce our panelists and kick this all off. Perfect. Hi, everyone. So my name is Isaac Mireles. I am an urban planner here in Orange County. Um, and really, just to give you a quick overview of how I got into the housing movement and urban planning itself, um, I was a student at UCI for about four years, and then I did my graduate program um, for another two years. And really, during my time there, I experienced different levels of nimbyism um, and really opposition for students um, in terms of trying to get more housing being built. We essentially established, um, we did a townhouse or a, a townhome area and a lot of people came out. Um, there was a development that was trying to be proposed in a golf course and um, people were not happy. And so that kind of radicalized me and made me question why people weren't um, supportive of uh, housing for students. And so I did a, a study on the effects that graduate students and undergraduate students have. And essentially that got me um, 
It let me know that students really struggle. There's not enough housing and the cost of living continues to go up. And that affects other uh, areas in your life, including um, food insecurity, uh, which leads to more housing insecurity. Um, but I'll touch more on that a little bit later. So if we can start with the introductions of our panelists, um, Lori, Berkeley Council Member. Hi, everyone. All right, am I muted? Oh, I'm not. Good. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, it's nice to see you all, and thank you so much for having me. I'm super happy to be here, uh, especially now that there's so many people engaged in this pro-housing advocacy. As you probably know, it hasn't always been this way. Um, well, I'm sure this panel is going to talk a, uh, a fair amount around the tension in, in college towns in particular. I can't overstate how much it's improved over the past five years uh, with this movement. Um, in 2014, when I was advocating for, for more homes for people, I felt like I was on an island alone. And I was perplexed too, because I was reading all of this research about how to make towns affordable. And I was, I was, I was, I was dumbfounded because um, all I was seeing were people coming to council meetings advocating against housing. And it wasn't only older homeowners, students came as well. Um, so I'm super excited that there's been really the sea change and this shift um, to advocate for homes for, for everyone. And I think it's, it's one of the most important movements of our time, I, I really do. I think it relates to, um, you know, as, as Isaac mentioned, food insecurity, of course it relates to homelessness, um, income inequality, everything. I feel like there's a, a, an enormous tie and particularly in California um, with our history with Prop 13 and um, a, a lot of uh, exclusionary zoning rules. Um, it's incredibly important that we continue to advocate and make sure that people have a place to rest their head at night. Thanks. If I could have um, Sam, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Sam Bunting. I am from a group called Walkable Princeton. We have been set up since 2012, uh, advocating for housing opportunity, equity, and walkable urbanism in the town of Princeton, New Jersey. Thanks very much for including me in the panel tonight. Burr, can you hear me? Yes. If you can introduce yourself, Burn. Uh, hello, nice to be here with you guys. Uh, I think it's gonna be a wonderful panel tonight. My name is Burhan Azim. Uh, I'm based in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, so uh, to give a little background because um, I think that most of the people here are probably from California. Cambridge is home to a couple different universities, MIT and Harvard, but also <laughs> Leslie uh, Holt School, uh, International School of Business, uh, the Cambridge Culinary Institute. Um, and so I um, am now in a recent MIT graduate. I graduated about a year ago. Before that, um, I was at MIT. And um, it was a really exciting time because I think that after the 2016 election in particular, um, it was a catalyzing event for a lot of people on campus. And so uh, there was a lot of political work to be done. Um, and that's when I first got involved in both like local politics and housing as well. And um, over the years, we've seen like dramatic student engagement in the city in that um, part of the work that we've done has caused the first year after that a 250% increase in student voting and then subsequent increases after that such that like now students are voting at the same rate as local residents or long-term residents um, in the city which has been very exciting and as part of that um, I ran in 2019 for our local city council and uh, while I didn't quite win we were very close and because Cambridge has ranked choice voting, it helped elect our first ever UMB supermajority, which is what we need to pass zoning laws. And so it's a very exciting time. Our new affordable housing overlay was just reintroduced a few days ago. So hopefully that'll get passed soon. Um, and thank you. That's awesome. So from what, I, what I'm hearing is it's a really a student versus um, 
you know, homeowners type of mentality. I think the friction here is not just in Orange County, Irvine, where I live, but it sounds like it's, it's everywhere here. And so it's, it's not one in one city where it's only taking place. It's, it's everywhere. And so um, anyone want to touch on the friction, uh, why that friction occurs? If a uh, Berkeley council member wants to touch on that briefly, and then we can go around. Sure. Um, gosh, I got so excited. I, I forgot the, <laughs> the whole name. Uh, I'm Lori Drosty. I'm, I'm in Berkeley, um, on Berkeley City Council. And don't fret if you run for office and you didn't win, um, you know, that you can always try again. When I first ran in 20, uh, 2014, I won by 16 votes with rank choice. Wow. So, um, it's a, you know, that's, that's how you, you win is you just keep running. So, that's a just wanted to say that you know i i think there there are many reasons why there's uh tension um you know speaking specifically and i'll, I'll try to be as as brief as possible uh, specifically in berkeley i think a lot of the tension is because of our um, antiquated zoning so what you have is Can you hear me? Yeah, there you go. Okay. I think you go. I right. accidentally muted. Muting. Um, you have a community where um, you have uh, a single family zoning very close to campus um, and residents are concerned that students are, are piling into single family homes and, um, and uh, you know, having parties uh, late at night. Um, but then at the same time, we also see um, some resistance uh, to building denser housing along our transit corridors. So those seem to be fundamentally sort of opposed to each other. They, you know, it, on the one hand, you don't want students to move in, into neighborhoods uh, because there's no housing available. So they take over a larger single family home and, you know, we'll have uh, quite a few students live in there, uh, but at the same time, there's a resistance to um, to apartment buildings. So, um, I think you know, you anyone who's on this call that lives in a in a college town, I, I think um, there's there's a tension. You know, I I've heard that students are are transient. They're not uh, they're not committed to the community. Um, you, you, hear, you hear all sorts of things uh, about um, the role of students and the role students should have in a community or should not have in a community. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a long history there, especially in Berkeley. Um, we've had um, many dif different disputes with the university. Um, some, I think, with merit and some, um, you know, are, I think, um, represent a lot of uh, homeowners who feel uh, that the that universities are are taking over towns and and they're losing that uh, small town vibe. So um, there's there's a lot of tensions, but I'll let the other panelists talk about their particular towns. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead if I, if either of uh, you guys want to speak on that. Yeah, um, um, I can I can jump in. Or, yeah, I mean. Uh, uh, speaking here in Princeton, I would say that uh, there's a lot of, there is animosity towards the university in the town. The, the animosity doesn't come from me. Uh, I'm pretty supportive of Princeton University and anything that they want to do to expand. And Princeton University is a pretty good school. I mean, it's not as good as Rutgers University where I work, but it's okay. And I'm, I'm supportive of, of their expansion plans. But a lot of people in the town are not. And I think that it comes down to a couple of things. One of them is traffic. Uh, local res some local residents assume that any addition of new housing is going to bring more traffic because these people drive cars everywhere all the time. Um, so they assume that if more people come, if the university expands, it's going to mean more traffic. It's going to make it harder for them to park. And they don't want that. And a second thing that some local residents really uh, despise is uh, the thought of more children in the school district. Uh, believe it or not, there are quite a lot of, uh, of children haters in Princeton. 
And they hate the, they don't like new residents coming in because they think that it's going to add more students to the school district and that's going to drive up their taxes. And one of the problems with um, Princeton University, of course, is that it's a tax exempt organization. So if the university expands, it isn't necessarily adding a lot more tax revenue to the town. So the perception is that expansion of the university uh, necessarily brings costs to the town which have to be met by the local residents. And I think that that's a major source of the animosity. Uh, to jump in there a little bit, uh, I wanted to first echo what uh, both of the other panelists have said a little bit uh, beforehand and then talk about um, Cambridge specifically. So I think Cambridge is a little bit of a different situation in that um, like Harvard, for example, has been here before the state existed in the country. So I think that like a lot of places, there's a sense that like students are invaders, but like students have been here uh, before the city was here. And like uh, both Cambridge and MIT, uh, both Harvard and MIT have their own police force, for example. So it's, a, it's an interesting situation. I don't think that there's necessarily as much animosity towards students in general versus what has happened in the last decade, especially, is that a lot of the big companies ended up being focused on a highway route beforehand. So a lot of students wouldn't necessarily stay in Cambridge after graduation. But now that in the last decade, we've had a huge biotech boom in Cambridge, a lot of people are staying in here right after graduation. And that's really been good for the city in that like a lot of tax revenues have gone up. Um, there was a new billion dollar school that was built. Um, but also like, because a lot of students are saying rents have gone up a lot. Um, and so it's really been a tension point um, uh, around what's been happening in Tyndall Square. So I think that's the specific uh, thing that's been happening here. Yeah, in, in my experience, so I go, I went to UCI and what happened here was they try to pass an ant or a boarding house ordinance where they try to limit the amount of students that could be on a, in, in a single family house. And so really you had this tension, um, the homeowners resisted students living anywhere near them with this ordinance. And then you basically had on top of that, um, a lack of supply. Um, so what we organized is we, we try to rally the students and there's a really strong student base. And I, and I think I also want um, the panelists here to touch on that is that the, the students are a strong base and a strong voice, um, especially if your student population is around 30,000 students, you know, that could be a, an election defying base that you can really tap into. Um, and so it's really activating the space and, and asking them how can we bring them on board when there's decisions being made at the city council level that affects them directly. Um, that's what I found. The more reading and the more that I started learning about the things that happen at City Hall, you know, the more invested I got and the more I started to show up. Um, so, uh, and then you start getting the university involved as well. And so if, if anybody wants to talk about the engagement of students um, and your, your involvement with trying to reach them, does anybody have any, any say in that? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I mean, Excellent. I, I'm, I'm really excited now to engage students. It was, it was challenging, again, in 2014 for, um, for me to engage with students. And it was really frustrating because at that time, um, there, as I had mentioned, there were, there were students, uh, the main students, coming to council talking about land use, were coming out talking against uh, building homes. And so I was just so perplexed by that. And now we see with, you know, Cal Dems, particularly in the past couple of years, um, have become very active in advocating for more homes. So that's really thrilling. I, um, you know, I've, I have been on Twitter for a long time, so I have uh, 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 looped into city politics, um, probably some names that you uh, recognize, whether it's Daryl Owens or Diego Aguilar, Cannibal. Um, and I see, uh, you know, I, I see uh, two, two Berkeley folks on the line here with uh, Shane and Terry. Um, and so just in terms of students though, uh, Berkeley has 38 commissions, which is a whole other story, but uh, we have 38 commissions and 
I think it's really incumbent as an elected to try to make sure that I diversify the voices on the commission. So I have student commissioners um, and I try to make sure that I, that I don't just appoint people from my district. In fact, I've, I've, I've frankly gotten some shit for that uh, because I want to have a variety of voices and I represent a relatively white wealthy district. And I want more of, I want those, those are the people who participate in commissions all the time. So I want to make sure that I have uh, more voices. And so I always try to make sure that I have student uh, representatives, that I have racial diversity, that I have uh, economic diversity. Um, I think that's really important to have an engaging representative democracy. So I, I, I actually take great pride in trying to be very thoughtful about that because it, it's very easy for me to find commissioners uh, you know, I have plenty of people who volunteer all the time and they're mainly uh, white male identified and retired, right? And so I could fill my commission spots pretty easily, but I want to take an, I want to take time to make sure that I'm engaging with a broader sector of my community so we can hear those student voices. And I, and I truly think it makes a difference. Um, so I've, I, do a fair amount of, of unconventional outreach uh, and and try to engage people in that way. You know, just speaking of of Daryl, I, I think right after he had graduated from high school, I saw I saw he didn't have a you know a picture and he was tweeting about Lang and I said, oh my gosh, this is somebody who uh, <laughs> who I want to get engaged in Berkeley politics and he um, and you could tell he was really smart. And I said, "Hey, do you want to, you know, do you want to meet? Do you want to be appointed to something? And uh, why don't we meet at a bar?" And he said, well, I'm not, "I can't meet at the bar because I'm not 21 yet." Um, <laughs> and so, you know, just trying to reach out and and encourage people that you don't have to know everything to get involved in the politics. And I think that's fundamentally one of the biggest challenges that people have is that you don't have to know everything and and particularly with um uh you know with women and you you don't you don't have to be perfect to run for to run for office to get engaged and that's what i just try to instill in folks that we need to make sure that we broaden our net uh, so we hear more students thanks thank you I can, I can say something about students. Uh, in my experience, although the majority of the largest number of students are undergraduates, in our experience, we have found that graduate students and other university affiliated staff like postdocs are more likely to take a stronger interest in municipal affairs. That may be because undergraduates are just or cycling through so quickly that they don't really see a whole lot of um, a whole lot of point and in investment in, in, in local politics. Um, or it may be that the problems of housing affect uh, graduate students and postdocs more. Uh, certainly in, in Princeton, the university provides accommodation for all undergraduates, but that's not the case for all graduate students and certainly not for postdocs. So we found that by reaching out to the, the graduate student union, we've been able to engage some graduate students who have come to uh, local planning and the council meetings and have been able to make the case uh, for uh, more housing, for more bike lanes and things like that. And that's really been very positive because the, the council members here in Princeton love to hear from new people, new, new voices. Typical council meeting here, it's the same 10 or 20 old guys that show up every week. So when some graduate student, somebody, somebody fresh comes in with some new ideas, they're always very interested to hear that. And I'm hoping that some of those people who are some really smart people are going to join some of our local boards and commissions now and help to influence policy here in Princeton. Um. So I wanted to echo again what both of my panelists said and then have some specific um, uh, details I can fill in here. Uh, so I wanted to start with what Sam said around graduate students. So I think that 
it is a very strong point with graduate students in that graduate students, unlike undergrads, are usually much more price sensitive. And that's typically the case if you're like 26, 28 years old and you're making $40,000, especially if you're international and your spouse can't work, like that can be a very difficult circumstance. And so graduate students typically have a higher focus on like housing and housing affordability. And that was one of like the catalysts that we've had in Cambridge is around like uh, both allowing the city to like loosen zoning laws, but also use some of the city's leverage to try to get the university to build more housing. And then the city would have to zone for that housing to be built. Um, and so I think that is a very good catalyst if you're looking for some place to start. Um, I would say to go off of that, um, I would say that undergraduates and graduate students are very different populations in that graduate students are much more dispersed. They typically uh, are more independent. They don't really connect as a larger community in a lot of ways and more department oriented. And so, um, but at the same time, they do care a lot more about these sorts of issues. And so to get affiliated with a graduate student association or something like that can be a great starting point. Um, but you'll hit some sort of cap, especially because a lot more of them also end up being international around here, around 50% of graduate students are international students. Um, for the undergraduate population, uh, I think it's a little bit more difficult in that people may not um, be automatically engaged as much, but I think there's huge headwind. So in Cambridge, the average age is 29, but the average voting age in a municipal election is 56. So basically no one under the age of 45 votes. And so if you were looking for a first group to engage, you might think, oh, well, there's a lot of 29, 30 years old to get engaged, but it's really difficult to find like a thousand people to go and aspire to. What's nice about undergraduates is that they might all have an emailing list or like 300 of them live in one dorm. And so like, it's really, if you can make like uh, friends in those or get uh, or, like, you know, access to people and like win over a few individuals, then you have access to like thousands of people that you can now reach. And so one thing that we found that was very successful is just emailing everyone with like, here's a list of the things that affect you in Cambridge, you know, bike lanes, housing, um, here's the reasons you should care, LGBT rights, uh, um, et cetera, et cetera. And we emailed a letter to every single undergraduate with a voter registration form. And we got, and um, stamps as well. Stamps are very important because in Cambridge, you can't register to vote on online unless you have a driver's license, which no one does. Um, and no one owns stamps. Uh, I've never met anyone who owns stamps. And so you email, so you send them a letter with like the letter of voter registration form and a return stamp. And we got 500 voter registration forms that way. So that was an extremely effective method for us. Um, and on top of that, um, it's difficult for, depending on the laws and the regulations around your local university to get access to dorms and to try canvassing directly. Um, but we found was that we were able to train four or five student canvassers and they went canvassing in the dorms. And that was also another very effective rate where we got another two to 300 voter registration forms. And so those were a few taxes, tactics that we found were very helpful in terms of actually getting people uh, registered and voting. Awesome, and if I could just add a few things for that. Um, you know, graduate students, at least, at, in the UC system are not guaranteed housing. Um, at UCI, the undergraduate population is guaranteed housing, but graduate students for the most part have access to it, but they aren't 100% um, guaranteed. And so that basically pushes them to find housing elsewhere. Um, the second point that I really wanna mention is there's a lot of studies coming out from, um, I believe the researcher's name is Sarah Goldrick Rabb. She's been doing a lot of work with um, food insecurity and housing insecurity. And, um, you know, the, one of the most pressing issues is that the people of color, in particular Black students, are the most affected population um, when it comes to housing and homelessness. And so if anybody wants to touch on that subject, I think it's very important, especially right now, um, given the time and the circumstances, we really need to reach out to that student population to make sure that they're taken care of. So if anybody wants to go ahead and, and um, touch on that subject, go ahead, Bram. Um, yeah, so I wanted to go back to that. Um, I think that, and also what was mentioned in the comments a little bit, um, is that like, A, like the housing, like insecurity part is extremely important because like, I think that there's a sense of like, especially if you go to a very elite college that like you're very well off, which may not necessarily be the case. Um, 
and so that point is important. The second is I saw in the comments um, and in the chat add questions about like voter registration policies. And I think like the biggest thing to point out there is like, especially if you're an undergraduate, you're like 17, 18 years old. This is going to be like the first election you've ever thought of. Like the biggest problem that we had is like, no one had an idea how to vote, first of all, or had even thought about voting before in their lives. And so, you know, because the university doesn't do it and they're not near their parents, you have to kind of act as like a figure introducing to them to the world of voting. And so we had about like 30 kids who showed up the day of the election at the voting location, having never registered wanting to vote. And you have to explain to them, that's not how it works. You have to like spend time two months beforehand registering to vote. And so I think that in terms of policies that make a huge difference, like day of voter registration would be the biggest. Um, but, you know, um, like, you know, like, it's just like, I think the biggest process is like, you know, how do you explain to someone who's never voted before because they've never been eligible, like, you know, introduced introduced to the world because it is very, very strange if you've never thought about it before i think we have a question Isaac, I can yeah say, we do have i can say, say something about about yeah go ahead sorry i can say something about uh, uh the issue of uh minority housing as well which is something which uh is part of uh our origin story for the walkable princeton group is that uh, uh, one of my colleague, David Keddy, who founded the organization, actually works as a pastor uh, tending to students and university staff at Princeton University. And one thing that he was hearing from them, especially from minority, uh, minority people, was that when they went looking for housing in the town, they were getting passed over by landlords who were effectively discriminating against them in an unlawful fashion. And I think that this is something which is always going to crop up whenever you have a housing shortage situation, is that people who are marginal are going to be disproportionately affected by that. And so whenever we are talking about increasing housing opportunities, and we're trying to get across the message that uh, whereas most people think that developers are the villains because they're like, I to get some money and they're also greedy, that actually the villains are the people who are trying to stop housing being built because when they do that, then it makes it more difficult for people to find places to live. And that burden always falls disproportionately on marginal and minority populations. So it's very important for us from an equity standpoint to push the point that more housing opportunities is vital for equity purposes. I would, <clears throat> I would agree with uh, with both of my colleagues' statements. You know, um, UC Berkeley um, commissioned a survey and found that ten percent of the students have experienced homelessness while attending UC Berkeley, while twenty percent of the postdoc students have experienced homelessness. Uh, UC Berkeley provides fewer beds per student than any other school in the UC system. Um, on top of that, we have it so um, students are unable to access uh, affordable, affordable housing within, within the city. They're, they're ineligible to be part of that lottery system for those subsidized units. So that is something that I think a lot of people are unaware of, um, not, not, not people like us who are, who are into these types of issues, but when, um, when people say, you, you know, we need to have affordable units within the city for students, they can't access them. So th the only thing they have available to them within the city is market rate units. And, um, oh, my daughter's coming right over here. So, <laughs> yes. Um, so anyway, this is this real life Zoom session here. Um, and so I'll let somebody else take it over from there. Uh, just one second. <laughs> Hang on, sweetie. Yeah, just to echo um, what the council member was saying is you essentially can't get any access to public housing or any um, affordable housing if you're, you are a student. And so that really limits you even more, more so. And so 
I wanted to dedicate the last portion of this to solutions. I know we've talked about uh, voting, and I think that's the, one of the most essential portions of it is getting the right people in positions of power and to make these decisions. But once they're there, you know, what policies do we push for? Uh, do we do we move forward and and advocate for it? Um, if anybody wants to touch on that. Sure, I can, I, you know, there, there are many different things. Um, <clears throat> well, oftentimes, uh, local city councils weigh in on state bills, which I think is really important. Um, we've had several uh, state bills put forward, uh, particularly by um, uh, our great representatives here in the Bay Area, Senator Nancy Skinner, for one. Um, another thing that, uh, another way to, to advocate is, particularly in California, we are living in a remnant of uh, a racially, I mean, we're, we're living in the midst of a racially unjust society, number one. Uh, but we also, within our zoning patterns, are still living in segregated communities um, in which you have uh, essentially apartment bans in certain parts of uh, cities. So for instance, I represent uh, an area within Berkeley, which is sort of the birthplace of single family zoning. Uh, the reason why it was created uh, was to uh, forbid African American dance halls and Chinese laundromats. And these lines are directly related to redlining. And the fact that this is still happening and they're still defenders of this archaic system is, is baffling to me and it's, and it's wrong. And you know, it, it may not be <laughs> may not be politically smart of me to advocate against this because um, you know it's it's certainly um, this is this is the, the bulk of my district. Um, it makes I think uh, moral sense to do it. So um, that's one thing is looking at your zoning and um, and really trying to uh, advocate for uh, walkable communities and housing along our corridors. Um, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty simple. You know, we, as somebody mentioned earlier, when we are on the dais, and you're right, and we see, um, you know, these are wonderfully regularly engaged residents. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put people down who spend their, um, spend every week with us. You know, it's, they're passionate about it, and I think that's great. Um, but I will say, when we see a new face, <laughs> it's, it's always sort of, oh, who, who is that? <laughs> oh, it's a student. Oh, uh, you know, and we listen to everybody, but, but it is, it's, it, and, and, you know, any elected who tells you otherwise is not telling you the truth. When you, see, when you see or hear a voice that you haven't heard every week, it's perfectly natural to say, oh my gosh, well, what, what do you have to say? What are you doing here? And so when we hear from students in particular, and speak from speak from their heart about their experiences uh, in in with housing insecurity. Um, it resonates, and so I think you know not only pursuing smart policies, uh, but also telling telling a story, telling a story about why this matters to you and why it should matter to your electeds. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, I think that Laurie did a great job talking about like hard laws and regulations. So I wanted to take um, the opposite approach and talk about like how soft power that city councils can have can have a really big impact. Um, so the way that like, you know, it works here is that like uh, you have like 25% of the population is students, uh, but really most of their lives are governed by the universities, which is why I think that there's also low participation city council matters here. So like MIT, Harvard, Leslie, they do a great um, time. Um, they, they, they do a lot to manage students um, and students have a really hard time disagreeing or um, counteracting measures, especially if they're anti-student. Uh, so like MIT, for example, this year effectively raised graduate student housing prices by 40%. Um, and so working with city councilors and city council who has a lot of power over these universities in terms of zoning and what they're allowed to do in terms of other matters um, 
is really effective. And so I think that building those links between city councilors um, and students, especially the representatives in terms of undergraduate and graduate student presidents, like is really powerful. And it's not an explicit law, but I think it has a really big impact here. If I, can, if I can say, you know, in terms of what I think we need to be doing, obviously changing zoning laws so that we can get more housing is just so important. We need housing for desegregation. We need housing to combat the coming climate crisis. But anytime we talk about changing zoning, getting more housing, we have to expect that there's going to be resistance from local residents who only ever see new housing in terms of costs. So I think that it's very important for us as advocates to try to present a whole different vision about what new housing can mean and about how we can uh, reorient our town so that the new housing isn't just bringing problems, but is actually making the town better by strengthening the tax base, by providing more opportunities for uh, customers, for local businesses, and for transit opportunities. We have to frame the housing as something which is really positive and try to use that as an opportunity to bring people on side. Because uh, whenever we're constantly debating things in terms of costs, we're in a losing battle. So one of the things that we've been trying to do at Walkwell Princeton is to try to, to uh, encapsulate that vision for what Princeton could be in the 21st century with more walkable urbanism, more density, and more inclusivity. Perfect. If I can just briefly touch on what the university at UCI has been doing. Um, we, they've been essentially eliminating these single story and two story apartment complexes that they had and they've upzoned it. Isaac, you're muted. You, you muted yourself. Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I was just saying um, the university here at UCI, what they've been doing is they've been eliminating slowly the two-story apartment complexes that they have and upzoning it for five stories. And so, you know, that wasn't necessarily done at the city level. That was more of the UC, you, uh, uh, that was more of the university internally making that decision. But it, 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 was, it came from pressure from students and advocates. Um, and that was about a five to 10 year, uh, this is before I was there, but this was a movement that had already started. And so I think um, it's a combination of what everybody spoke on. And in addition, also pushing, you know, the administrators at your respective university to, to come up with a solution and work with the elected officials as well. Yeah, you know, it, there, <clears throat> There, there's so many different uh, policy avenues that that we can all pursue. Um, you know, as everyone else was was mentioning, um, it, it, I started to think about um, one particular project that came before Berkeley City Council. Uh, you know, in the heart of our downtown, on top of our uh, our transit station. And uh, that particular uh, housing project uh, had reached its 39th public hearing. <laughs> so um, there was a lot there, uh, over many years and, um, and not, a, not a whole lot was accomplished, I think from, from the, the, the eighth to the 39th, I, I don't know. I actually wasn't even elected when those hearings started. Uh, but then, you know, I was two years in by the time we voted on it or a year, maybe a year in. Um, so, you know, figuring out how we can uh, streamline some of these processes. Uh, I think, you know, and it, it, you can make the connection to, you know, how that can benefit uh, young people and students very, very clearly. You know, make, making sure that we, we streamline these processes, try to make some more things administrative. I know that at least in Berkeley, that's just like, if you say something like that, people get incredibly freaked out. Um, but 
you know, not everything needs to be um, picked apart, right? If you set objective standards. And when I, you know, I saw in the chat, somebody asked about, you know, how, how do you message this to, to my constituents? And it's being as honest as possible, really. Um, and, and trying to really just dig into to what people are concerned about, right? Um, some people just, you know, they just come to oppose housing because that's just like their thing, right? But then other people, um, you know, have some, have some, some concerns around, you know, how will this impact traffic? And so you can, you, you have an avenue in which to talk about um, traffic mitigations and around, you know, how uh, around carbon footprints and how if you create more housing for people who don't have to commute <laughs> long distances and can live in their community, that's a good thing. Um, so I think just, just having really open and honest conversations with people um, and, and try to connect it again to, to stories um, is, is helpful. But you, you know, you just, sometimes you're just not gonna please everyone either. You know, I'm really hopeful listening to, to everyone here. Really, I, it, it felt like I was, you know, two years ago speaking to someone and there was nobody listening, but it, there's a lot of people out here that, that do have the same um, perspective of building more housing and finding ways to do that. So it's really, really nice to hear um, this conversation. Um, does anybody else want to add? Yeah, or is I, there questions in the chat? Sorry, I, don't, I haven't seen that. There's two hand raised, so Sean and Elizabeth. So Sean, go for it. Okay, right. go ahead, Sean. I'll keep this brief. So, uh, yeah, I my last summer, my friend spent the entire summer living on my couch because their work was so far away from their home that they had to sleep on my couch at night. The summer before that, they were homeless and they were student, and they're also transgender. So the thought of them being outside when they're extremely vulnerable to being attacked or harassed really scares me. Um, but also I think two things we can do is we can cut taxes by defunding police departments. In Santa Cruz, we have a $30 million police department. If we cut that by 20 million that with 68,000 residents in Santa Cruz, that's $295 per person per year in tax refunds that can easily go to their rent. So simply cutting taxes by also cutting police department budgets would be a great way to just give relief to everybody. And um, I agree with uh, what everybody was saying, Santa Cruz students, they are more apt to protect the environment than to advocate for housing. Two years ago during 420, they had a big banner that said, protect Porter Meadows, because we were about, we were about to prove a plan to build more housing there. And this is a place where, where everybody is, is struggling with housing, and yet they were more concerned about preserving the meadow than building housing. So I, I agree that that's a really difficult issue. But somebody, I think Sam Bunting talked about uh, selling this to people. You can say, if there are more people in our community, we have a larger tax base. So we can, if we have more people paying lower taxes, we actually still have the same amount of revenue, possibly even more. So you can say that if we have a larger tax base, if more people move in next door to you, we can lower your taxes. But because there's more people here, the city will still have the same quality of fire, police, public services. So I think that's one way we can sell it to people to uh, overcome their initial nimbyism. Yeah, and I would also just uh, call out Zach Subin, who's on the call, but uh, muted, um, who is the head of Urban Environmentalists, um, which is a EMB Action Network organization that talks about the environmental impact of low density housing and on the flip side the, all the incredible environmental benefits of dense infill housing um, so there's lot his website urban environmentalist.org lots of great um, resources and language there but there absolutely is an environmental case to be made for housing and, and love the idea of using that to organize students so yeah um, I guess Elizabeth you're next you raise your hand yeah this question is for Lori um, so I live in a town in the north part of Orange County called Fullerton, and we actually are home to the largest Cal State uh, in, the, in the system. So we are a college town, um, though I think residents are want to really embrace that. Uh, at one point we had a master plan, specific, specific master plan for the campus area, the area around campus, and they called it College Town. And 
it really was the area immediately adjacent to the university. It did not spread into, you know, neighborhoods. Um, and signs showed up that said, our town, not college town. So there was a lot of NIMBY resistance to it. But so my town has, we have some apartments, but we have a lot of single family homes because that's the era it was built in. And I'm curious how you talk about putting multifamily housing in single family neighborhoods, because it is, there is an attitude here that, you know, single family neighborhoods are, uh, you know, set, what, sacred and that any, any, anything to disturb a single family neighborhood is, you know, might as well be sacrilegious. And I find it really frustrating, but I also know I happen to live in a single family neighborhood because I'm married and have a child and that's the kind of housing that fit my lifestyle when I bought it 10 plus years ago. Um, you know, I don't know how I would feel if they, you know, I mean, we're, there was a law that said you could up zone to a fourplex, right? So, I mean, that would affect traffic and it would affect parking and it would affect, you know, because none of the houses here have enough for four parking because people's junk is full, filling up their garage. So I'm just curious, like how you talk about that, because I mean, even I honestly have struggled with like, well, where exactly would we put that? Yeah. Well, a couple things. One, you know, it, it, during my last election, there was a uh, there was a bill in the state legislature that it, it was, you know, a significant upzoning bill. Um, I didn't I didn't weigh in on it, um, but you know, the my opponent was like she wants to build high rises, you know, all along, you know, these, these quaint, like I was just going to come out with, with uh, my bulldozer and, and, and I know many of you are like, all right, sounds good. And building, uh, you know, these, these skyscrapers all along this, um, these tree line streets. Well, you know, what I would say for, for people's fears is a couple things. One, just because you change zoning, doesn't mean that you're, you know, you're going to see these things happen overnight, right? So that's one thing. And then another thing is that I hear quite often from my constituents about um, their, and things have changed in the past couple of years with some state laws. Uh, for instance, that they want, their child can no longer afford to live in Berkeley. And they want to be able to have them move back into their large home. And I, I, I represent an area that has some large homes and they are unable to do so. Um, so being able to essentially divide up your house so you can um, you know, have, have separate homes, but within a contained single family home. Um, and then I think uh, just talking with people around, you know, traffic often, uh, is is a conversation, of, uh, but we have seen with uh, the the new additions of our accessory dwelling unit laws and backyard cottages um, that we've removed many parking restrictions. Not only in the state, you know, within the city of Berkeley, I was uh, I was really pushing to get rid of some of these parking requirements because it it also it impacts traffic in in making more traffic. And it affects affordability. So, I mean, this is probably too wonky for your your average neighbor, but but I think what really resonates with people is is making sure that you talk around equity in your city if you live in a progressive community. And do they think it's fair for some areas to have to allow uh, multifamily homes and other areas not? Right there's some legitimate arguments around um, fire safety and fire zones. I, you know, I'll, I'll give people that um, in higher fire areas. But do you want to advocate for a system that puts multifamily apartments in certain parts of the city, and primarily the people who live in those city in those parts of the cities are 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 residents who might be of a low lower socioeconomic class along major transit corridors or people of color. So is that equitable? Right. And, and that is, I think that's a really compelling argument. If you live in a progressive community and I have to deal with people who claim they're progressive all day long, but they don't want to address that fundamental fact. 
and I'm happy to get, you know, I'm happy to get in an argument with those people. <laughs> So, um, but I, I think it's just it, that equity argument, th there's no argument that you cannot argue that. Right. That is, that is a fact, right? And that is yeah. a remnant, that is a remnant uh, of, a, of a racist past and fr frankly, our, our racist present. Thanks. That's not something I had, it's not a, not a, I've, I've used the argument of, you know, People can't afford to live here anymore and it's because the only we only have one housing type or we have a dominant housing type and we don't have a real true diversity of housing types um but i the equity i mean especially right now if if you're not listening you know that that's a great argument so thank you well, and well and also i, I mean uh, what i hear and, and, and i'm sorry and then I'll, I'll i'll shut up what i also hear is people are also concerned about aesthetics and design truly like you just sort of your your normie, they also are really concerned around, around ugly apartment buildings, fair, right? But when you look at, particularly in, in before they put these zoning restrictions from way back when, the, the, the homes that were created in, in my district, they are beautiful fourplexes. They're beautiful bungalow courts. Um, so I think just this, the image of what people have in their mind about what a multifamily home looks like versus what it can be. Uh, you know, there's a design firm, uh, Opticos, uh, who specializes in missing middle housing. Yeah. They have great sort of depictions of, of what this looks like. Um, and this is naturally, this is not subsidized affordable housing. This is naturally affordable housing for our communities. Sorry, I'll let my, my colleague speak. Thanks. I can say something about single family homes. Single family home uh, zones are, are, are really tough. It's true. It's really tough to, to make things change there. Although that is where the there's a huge amount of opportunity there. So I would second what Laurie said about accessory dwelling units. You want to try to max out <laughs> accessory dwelling units as much as you can. Uh, make sure that they're allowed in all zones. Try to minimize zoning bulk standards, which can restrict the addition of uh, accessory dwelling units. That's something where we've actually made quite a lot of progress here in Princeton. Then we're also trying to uh, make it easier for people to build smaller homes. One thing that we're seeing in Princeton, which I think is probably also the case in other affluent communities, is that the zoning is so tight that the only kind of development that really pencils is for people, for developers to take, buy the old 1950s cracker boxes like the one that I live in, knock it down and build a huge McMansion which sells for like $1.3 million. So that's something we've seen all around town here is that this, this wave of McMansionization where older homes are replaced by these enormous um, kind of plasticky looking houses. And Local residents hate that. They absolutely hate it. So uh, they've been trying to introduce zoning to block the construction of big mansions, but it's actually pretty hard to do because anything that you do touching FAR or anything like that also tends to make it harder for people to build additions to their existing homes. So that's not popular either. One of the arguments that we're trying to make is instead of having all these McMansions, we should make it easier for people to construct, to subdivide the lot and build two nice tidy duplexes that would sell for a lot less money than, than these uh, gigantic McMansions which developers are going, are, are putting up. And by, you know, if we can make that resonate, then we can, you know, slowly shift from like single family homes on large lots to duplexes and hopefully start to move down that continuum uh, towards increased uh, missing mill housing options. Well, I just want to say thank you so much to all the panelists, Sam, Burham, Lori. It was an excellent discussion. We are out of time, um, four minutes over, uh, but you know, this discussion can go on and I'd love to continue it. As, uh, you know, I can go on for hours talking about this. Um, but um, I just want to say thank you to all and thank you to um, Yimby Nation for allowing us to speak on the subject. So, and um, Jillian, do you want to say 
some yeah, the last just couple words. Wrap, so thank you all just to wrap up. Let's continue the conversation. Um, if you are a EMB Action member, you can join our EMB Action Slack where we have 1,400 other people talking about this stuff all the time. We love the ideas around uh, partitioning lots. That's You're speaking our beautiful language. So let's keep the conversation going. Um, that's embaction.org slash join. Um, and I'll send up a follow-up tomorrow with um, more information about each of the, the panelists and how you can keep plugging in and the video from this so you can pass on to your friends. Um, but thanks everyone so much. This is a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night, everyone. Good Thank, night. You. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.